All right. Good morning, Facebook, and welcome to another episode of Track Live. Really excited to talk with you all this morning. We're going to be talking with a really a premier expert in the space about a, a hot topic, something that's getting a lot of attention. Professor Chris Barrett at University of Dundee. I'll bring him in in a second. Uh, but first, just wanted to introduce ourselves to those of you who are new, new to Track, new to what we're doing. This is a Track Male Fertility System, now available. This is a, a device that allows you to measure and track your sperm count completely in the comfort and privacy of your own home. Um, and we have some really recent news to share that as of last week, Track is now the number one uh, best-selling fertility device on Amazon. So big thanks to all of you, our customers, our supporters, our friends, for helping spread the word and build awareness about what we're doing. For those of you who haven't seen it before, the, the product consists of a device. Again, this is a completely at-home use device. It consists of an instrument, we call it an engine, runs on two AA batteries, and disposable test cartridges. These are called props. You get four of them in your kit, and it's a way to measure your sperm count. So you put a few drops of your sample in there, close the lid, and if you can see that, it, it spins around for about five minutes, gives you an accurate reading of your, your sperm count measured in millions of cells per milliliter. You can find it at trackfertility.com, or like I said, we're also available uh, on amazon.com. But now let's get into the topic that we want to talk about, something that's getting a lot of attention, um, and in part because of some recent research that has come out. So you may have seen the cover of Newsweek this week has the big headline, Who's Killing America's Sperm? Uh, and it goes into an in-depth story about Recent research shown a major decline in sperm counts, not only in America, but around the globe, and some of the reasons and hypotheses about why that's happening. Uh, Track and Sandstone, we were featured in the piece, as well as our guest today, Professor Chris Barrett from the University of Dundee, joining us all the way from Scotland. Professor Barrett, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, it's good afternoon. Well, good morning to you guys. Happy to be with you. Yeah, good afternoon to you, and, and thanks. This is great to be here. Could you maybe just take a few minutes, uh, introduce yourself, a little bit about your background, your expertise, your research interests, and, and what made you uh, get contacted by the good people at Newsweek for this piece? Yeah, so um, um, my name is Christopher Barrett. I'm a professor of reproductive medicine at the University of Dundee in, in Scotland. And just to let you know that uh, Dundee is the sunniest city in Scotland. So that's a very important uh, message to get a, across to your uh, audience. Um, my, my expertise is uh, in uh, male infertility, and I've been working on male infertility for probably 30 years. Um, but the, the reason I think that we were contacted is that I'm the chairman of the uh, expert working, working group of the World Health Organization Male Fertility Task Force. And what that's trying to do is, is developing new guidelines for male infertility and the diagnosis of the man and obviously then hopefully then the treatment of the man. So I think it was in that capacity that, that we got contacted by uh, Newsweek. My main research is, is just basically trying to understand how a sperm moves, how it interacts with the egg. Uh, and all of our work is, is basically on, on humans. Right. So I want to read actually the quote that they used from you in the Newsweek piece where you said, male infertility has been ignored for 30 years. What we understand can be written on a postage stamp. So describe that in a little bit more detail. In your opinion, you know, why do we know so little of, about, about male fertility today? Yeah, I, I think this was, this was perhaps slightly surprising even to myself, was that when we were trying to analyze all of the data and pull it all together for the guidelines for the, for the WHO, what was absolutely stunning was the fact that actually we know very little about, about the man for diagnosis and for treatment. And that, I think, was surprising to the experts around the room as well. So that, that was a very salient point for us. The, the question is, why is that so? And I think that's partially historical, because up until relatively recently, the man, as a, as a combination for infertility, was pretty well much ignored. Uh, Everything was due to, to, to female infertility. So it's only over the last 15 years or so has the man uh, been delineated to have any uh, use really <laughs> in, in conceiving. So it's it, the research base that people are working for the male is very much lower, substantially lower than the female. 
So what we understand, therefore, about the physiology of the production of sperm and, and the movement of sperm is very poor, actually. So with as as that base is so poor, it's very difficult then to make a lot of progress on diagnosis and treatment, at least using the historical information you have. Right. So the, I think the reason that this research got so much attention is is a uh, the big analysis. I mean, let's get into the details a little bit. A big analysis over the last forty years of basically a lot of studies that have been done and and showed trends that that there's a, a a big drop in the average sperm count in men. And a lot of these are are done by looking at men who are coming into a fertility clinic, having a semen analysis done, and then and then looking at that data. Um, and it showed a pro you know, people have been talking about those for a while. The the recent study showed probably more of a severe, a more steep decline than maybe was suggested earlier. So in your opinion, so is this real? And if if it's true that we know very little about male fertility, is it possible that um, you know, we just haven't been looking closely at this enough and, and that the data needs more attention before we start to sound the global alarm bells? Well, I, I think it's uh, the, I think the big attraction of the data and why it really got got uh, the press it did was because the, the methods that they used to analyze the uh, data, because previously people have been incredibly critical of this observation. Uh, and that's really been down to the fact of what techniques are used, for example, to count the cells. And what this analysis did was it basically only used data which used what they perceived to be an appropriate method of counting the cells. And therefore, that criticism of the methods was, was dissipated. Hmm. And what you then see is that actually that, that decline seems to be continual, which was very interesting from that. And therefore, even over the last sort of 20 years, there's still been this perceived decline in uh, sperm counts. Now, that was relatively universal in the data set that they saw uh, from specific groups of, of men. It wasn't universal throughout the world, but the parts of the world where, the, where there was limited data, there wasn't enough data to make conclusions. So I, I think that the data is relatively robust. And, the, and I think the potential uh, frightening part of it is it, it fits in the whole concept of uh, really the attack on the male, basically. Um, and what that really is, is that it's not just a decline in sperm counts. It's the perception that there's an increased risk of testicular cancer, for example. So the male reproductive health has been quite negatively affected or the, the indices for male reproductive health are showing quite significant uh, abnormalities, i.e. decline in sperm count arise in the uh, testicular cancer. And, and the testicular cancer uh, database throughout the world has, has been, been incredibly strong evidence for that. Mm. So I, I think the combo of those coming together and the align the criticism of one of the specific things related to sperm counts has been made it more powerful as, a, as an example. Yeah. Uh, now, why is that? Is another question. Well, that was my uh, question. Yeah, let's get the, what everyone wants to know. That's when the realms of speculation are, are really rife. But we, in the simple answer is we, we haven't got a clue. But uh, the main hypotheses are related to uh, the testis having a particularly vulnerable uh, period in, in, in when the baby's uh, the, uh, the baby's very young, eye before it's born, basically. Uh, so it's in neutral, and in that environment, it can have quite significant susceptibility. So the concept is that there's damage to the testis, and that's manifested when it's uh, the, the, the male uh, baby is is cut the reproductive age of a higher risk of cancer and a higher and a lower sperm count because the testis has been affected in neutral. I mean that's the main hypothesis at, at the moment. And there's a lot of evidence in animals to demonstrate that. There are odd mm. experiments in human uh, that give indications for that. So, so, so what's happening in utero? What are they exposed to that's causing the so, damage? So the idea is they're exposed to particular uh, environmental toxins, chemicals, or manipulations, which are affecting uh, the reproductive system. And that can be, for example, that can be related to uh, increased uh, environmental toxins, which affect 
the balance of the hormones and how the nursing cells for the sperm function and, and in fact divide. Uh, so, but the exact mechanisms I think are not understood um, because up until recently they haven't put the sperm counts in the testicular uh, cancer increase together. Um, and there's still some people who don't particularly subscribe to the decline in sperm counts up until, for example, the last few months. In fact. So but the idea is the primary effect is in, is in neutral. That doesn't mean to say there's not other effects. It's just that they're not as well hypothesized. Got it. So we have a, we have a question I keep, and I want to pop it up here. So the question is, is it possible that testing methods have just gotten better and maybe the drop isn't as steep as yeah, they... Yeah, possible, yeah. So, so that was the main criticism against those declines. Uh, the way that they addressed that in that particular paper was they only included data from one specific method of assessment, which was using a, 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 a new bar counting chamber. But that was deemed to be the best method to count sperm. Uh, by the by the WHO and in the manuals and, and basically they restricted that analysis to that type of data. Now it's possible that those uh, methods are not exactly the same as they were 30 years ago but mm -hmm. but the basic lab method is the same. Right. So maybe people counted them differently then but it, it, that would sort of be a bit unlikely I think. Yeah. Uh, so as someone who's been building a sperm counter for the last five years, I can attest to the difficulties in 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 counting and getting an accurate reading um, based on all these methods. So it's, yeah, it's no, it's, it's not a simple process uh, to do that. You know, it, it's not very easy. But the, the particular technique, the improved new bar counting chamber, has been used for probably 30, 40 years. So the errors around that are quite well known. Right, got it. Another question just popped in. Uh, so here's a good one: Does adrenaline impact sperm count at all? Uh, not, not, not that we've got a lot of data on that at the moment. I mean, stress has a negative effect on male fertility, and that's manifested uh, primarily uh, in in the, the frequency and the nature of intercourse, for example. And also, there's maybe an indirect effect uh, related to the fertility of the man, the production of sperm in a very high stress environment. And of course, stress is very individual. One stressful situation for me may not be the same for another person. Right. But that's, there is a concept that uh, stress can have quite a, a negative effect on reprodu male reproductive function. So one of the contributing factors could be, you know, our society is more stressed out or we're more career driven. That could have an impact. Right? And, and also there's a lot of other things related to, to that. So it's uh, the modern lifestyle is probably very different to what it was, you know, 45, 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and it's a com it could be even a combination of all those events together. So it's it. I think the first step is trying to establish if these abnormalities in the reproductive system is there sufficient evidence to think we should be doing something. And I think now there is sufficient evidence that we should look at it seriously. Uh, yeah. The next step is to, to work on how we do that and, and, and uh, what are those main hypotheses to test. Yeah, we, we really like to promote, you know, general healthy living for guys so, who want to be dads. And I think that's a fundamental concept. I mean, any doctor will tell you, you know, you need to don't drink, don't smoke, you know, the usual sort of story. But uh, it is particularly important for reproductive health because because that can get, you know, a number of factors can have quite a significant negative effect. So, for example, uh, a very high level of smoking may affect the DNA of the sperm, and not just the sperm count and sperm motility. Uh, so there is a moderate link with obesity, for example, but it's only a moderate link. Temperature mm -hmm. is another one. Extreme temperatures can have a negative effect. So I think all that combination uh, it comes to a similar type of message that most doctors would give, which is related to a relatively healthy lifestyle. You know, yeah. uh, trying to eat properly and don't eat, you know, maintain that the antioxidant type of defense mechanism. Let's go back to your original point. You said the leading hypothesis was around what what um, baby boys are exposed to in your in utero. So, is it possible that the outcome, the result of this, is 
more awareness for expecting mothers of young boys of things to not be exposed to? It could be. So they, they may be uh, uh, particular periods of time and they're more vulnerable. It may be the avoidance of uh, X, Y or Z. At the moment, that's just pure speculation. Right. Uh, it may be that it's just the environment. There's pretty well nothing you can do about it. It's yeah. just you know, the environment. So it, or it may be something very, very direct. We just don't. I think the, ant, the blunt answer is we don't know. Yeah. Again, yeah. We, Unfortunately. We, so you and I actually met in person for the first time at the American Society of Andrology Conference uh, earlier this year, where you gave a great keynote presentation, and it was it was around why male reproduction needs to be placed at the forefront of of public health research. Um, I was hoping you could maybe describe this morning a little bit about why male reproduction is so important and, and needs more more public attention. Yeah, I, I think the first thing, we've talked about the poor level of research into the men, so I wouldn't reiterate that. But the the main thing is related to male infertility and infertility is a very, very common uh, problem. You know, one in six or one in seven couples of reproductive age, you know, are diagnosed with infertility. And the male is said to contribute approximately 50 percent to that. So it, those figures make quite breathtaking numbers when you're dealing with uh, a medical uh, disease effectively. And many diseases are don't have the same frequency uh, as male infertility. They get a lot more attraction, a lot more publicity, etc. So it is a very common problem, basically, and it's being relatively ignored. If you flip it on the other side of the equation for reproduction, you will notice that that actually contraception in men has made no progress for a hundred years. So reproductive health in general, the ability to conceive or not to conceive as and when desired, are two very fundamental uh, uh, aspects that are that are really uh, poorly understood. You know, for example, we still have vasectomy or a condom for the male, and that's basically it. There isn't anything else. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a that's a damning indictment on uh, us as uh, healthcare professionals. You know, to leave everything just purely to to, to women and have no uh, development in the male is just ridiculous. How so? That's an point. That's something that gets a lot of attention anytime there's some new research coming out about male contraception. How far do you think we are away from actually having an, an accepted contraception method other than vasectomy and condoms. Yeah, well I think that there's been a, there's been there was a lot of progress in probably the 70s, 80s and 90s related to a hormonal male contraception in the early 2000s. Uh, and there was a lot of data to suggest by suppressing spermatogenesis significantly you could effectively uh, make some men pretty well much reversibly sterile. However, having said that, the the uh, compounds that we used, the side effects, it wasn't, you know, 95% effective, etc. Made it that 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 was probably not going to be a feasible approach. So all all the all the work was put into that uh, the one eggs in one basket basically, and that hasn't come to fruition, and it's very mm -hmm. unlikely to actually work now. So people have better had to go a little bit back to the drawing board and work out uh, maybe other potential methods to do that. I mean, there is a challenge because uh, a woman will ovulate generally one egg a month, but a man produces a thousand sperm in a heartbeat. So basically, you've got to stop a large number of cells uh, mm -hmm. and get into the egg, and you only do need one sperm. I know it's a famous, uh, <laughs> famous uh, use of words, but it is true. So stopping all those cells is challenging. And then the same thing for the man, you, it, most people would, would agree that it's best to keep spermatogenesis going. It's just make the sperm sterile. Ideally, that's what you want to do um, so that there's no adverse effects on uh, the hormonal profile of the man. So you've basically got to make those cells uh, ineffective. Uh, and that's, that's really where people are focusing. Them. It's a tough problem. Yeah. We had another question come in, but first I wanted to ask um, more about 
you lead this World Health Organization working group on male fertility, which I think is fascinating and something that probably a lot of people don't know that the World Health Organization is very dedicated to the fertility and reproduction space. Uh, can you describe the mission of the group? And, the, and the mission of the group is mainly to, to the WHO have been involved in fertility and fertility control for since the 60s effectively. And, they were, and in many ways, they were very pioneering in their approach to reproductive health. But what they're, they're, they are the WHO, so what they're very interested in is the whole aspect of reproductive health and, you know, that the whole spectrum that comes with that. Uh, and infertility has some very negative uh, uh, effects, in, particularly, in, uh, for example, in some places in Africa, where if a, if a lady is deemed to be infertile, she can be ostracized from the family, in fact, from the, from the local region and can have significant negative consequences to her personally. So it's not just, uh, it can have very serious consequences. So the, the WHO has uh, been taking this baton forward for some time. I think it's fair to say that, that up until about 2012, for 10 years previously, they, they dropped the ball, really. You know, the, 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 the research wasn't ongoing. They, they weren't maintaining the diagnosis, etc. So there was a renewed enthusiasm and a renewed uh, influx of money to be able to attack these problems. So really, we're riding on that to try and make sure that we, we make progress forward. Really. And it, it encompasses, there's, there, I'm one of six groups. So there's one group looking at IVF, there's one looking at IUI, there's one looking at female factors. So it's, it's all of us together trying to make a difference. Really. Yeah, that's actually leads into another question I had. You're, you're our first international guest on the, the series, and, and I think sometimes in the U.S. we live here in a little bit of a bubble. So maybe you can comment on how is male fertility, male reproduction viewed differently in different parts of the world? Yeah, I, I think I, my, I've been to the States quite, quite a lot. So I, I, my impression is it's not greatly different in the United States as where, for example, for Europe. That would be my general impression. I mean, there's always the mistake of associating male infertility with virility. There's always that error which occurs, and that's obviously not, not correct, and it needs to be dispelled. But I don't think Europe and, uh, and America has a big difference in that way. I think where male infertility is perceived slightly different is, is perhaps in the developing world, where there is still a, um, still a lack of acceptance that the man makes a contribution to the infertility. And you see that in a number of studies uh, that, are, that are performed. And, and that really needs to be dispelled and, and, and dealt with. There's where I would see differences in, in the men rather than between the states and Europe, for example. Right. Great. Um, so we had a question come in. This is actually interesting. You know, there's a big rise in, in genetic products and consumer genetics. And the question came in, so can, can genetics cause low sperm count. Is genetics a big part of, of this puzzle that we're trying to figure yeah, out? It, it is. I mean, traditionally, of course, genetics don't fit quite well with reproduction as with many other disorders, because if, if you have sterilizing genes for everybody, then there's no next generation. So, but uh, having said that, then men with very, very few sperm or no sperm or very low numbers of sperm motility, there is a very significant increased risk of genetic cause mm -hmm. or a strong association with that. So, for example, uh, if a man has uh, uh, XXY, so as, a, as another uh, sex chromosome, those are associated with poor sperm production. Uh, there's a chromosome, the, what, the male chromosome, and if bits of that are missing, then that is associated strongly with uh, poor uh, sperm production. So there are genetic uh, uh, causes for the, for the man. They are generally manifested overall where there's a very low sperm count, no sperm, or very few motile sperm. That's in general, the huge majority are on that end of the spectrum. Right. So, yeah, we're going to have to wrap up soon, but just a few last questions. It, it may be more for the context of, you know, I think people who are, are new to this area and, and maybe just people trying to start their family and thinking about fertility on an early level. And, what would your advice be? I mean, when they see things like Newsweek saying who's killing America's sperm and all about this global decline and alarm bells and you know, the end of the human species, 
what's your recommendation to to the general couple or or just to a man who's trying to be a dad and trying to learn what he can do? I I think the uh, the the main thing is, and it's it's a message which uh, is very very well versed amongst fertility people, but it doesn't seem to get through to the general public. Is that uh, chronological age has a very negative effect on fertility. It has a dramatic effect on women, and it has an effect on men. Hmm. So you know, unfortunately, it, it's a it's a it is an age issue. So age makes a very big difference. And as a consequence, you've got to look to uh, your reproductive health and your, your choices of having children probably a lot earlier than people are currently doing that. Because all the statistics demonstrate, uh, for example, age at first birth is dramatically increasing because people are leaving it longer and longer and longer to conceive a child. Uh, and I think there's several reasons for that. One is because we're more affluent society, we want A, B, and C before we then maybe help consider reproduction. And the second thing uh, uh, related to that is 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 that we want to reduce the family size in general. You know, years ago people had eight to nine children. Now they often want one or two, for example. So there's a lot of factors in the mix, but the age-old issue is a and yeah. that is a fundamental thing. So I, I would advise anybody who's thinking about their fertility to, to basically not delay. I mean, I know it sounds very basic, but I think that is a fundamental thing to get across to people. Uh, don't wait till you've got a you know a new car or whatever. Um, you know, just just basically look at it from the point of view of, of uh, the longer you leave it, the you've got a very much chance of not having children. And assisted conception will help. It is assisted, but it's generally incredibly expensive. And it's only on average, you, you, it only has got a live birth rate on average of 25%. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that and that doesn't improve with time. So, unfortunately, it's a very basic message, but it, it, hopefully some people can take that on board. Youth is wasted on you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't, don't fight Mother Nature and you're not you're not likely to win. Exactly. And I think that that is a very truism to, to take. You know, Mother Nature will take the take the toll on reproduction. So you lose your reproduction function before you use your somatic function usually. Right. And that that's that, that's a fundamental that just won't go away. Well, that's good advice. Good to go out on. Professor Chris Barrett, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for all you do and your contributions to this field. This has been great. I'd encourage anyone who's listening Write in questions, put them on our Facebook page, uh, send us an email, uh, check out trackfertility.com, and you can contact us through there. And, and again, we're, we're here to help build awareness and bring education on a, a vastly underserved topic. So thank you all for joining us. Dr. Barrett, thanks, and, and we'll see bye. you next time. Bye. Bye.